It's a great pleasure to be here at DAFest. This is a great event, and we kicked off with an amazing keynote. And I couldn't be happier to be here in this event, and where we talk about making a difference. And maybe a little bit related to the theme today, what I'm going to talk about is contributing to making a difference in a um, underrepresented part of the, the society. I hope this is going to be a fun talk. I will try my best to make it as enjoyable as possible. There are a lot of new tech involved and um, making a difference. Let's start with the boring bits. This is the, the usual introduction slide. I'm Arman Amjalar. That's the, the correct pr uh, pronunciation of my name. I come from Berlin, um, here in Germany. I work for a company called UNU GmbH and I serve as the head of software engineering there. What we do is we build electric scooters, electric um, motorcycles, much like Vespa, but with uh, batteries. And then we are also inventing tools for the future of mobility and um, urban mobility. I'm also a founder of um, something called Lonja Works, which is a software craftsmanship school for women um, that is completely voluntary because we have um, a huge gap to, to close for the, um, um, between, between different genders, and we try to help uh, the best we can. I'm also um, active on GitHub. I have a lot of open source libraries, from uh, front-end libraries to back-end libraries to brain signal processing and making music with the browser. Most of them are in JavaScript. Almost 90% of them are in JavaScript. It's all open source. I, like everything I have written in my personal career is open source. So if you are interested in any of these topics, you can check out uh, my GitHub. Before we start, um, I'm also a little bit, a little bit um, under the weather. I, I had a flu for the past two weeks. So if I cough during the, um, the presentation, I apologize for that. Um, I don't want to irritate your ears, but I, um, yeah. Sometimes I, I might need that. So the question is very, very simple. The question is, what is the ultimate hack of our lives? And this came into um, my imagination while I was attending a, a meetup in Berlin. And that was called Berlin Hack and Tell. So hackers around Berlin and other, other cities got together. They do it every month at the, um, at the end of the month and they present their hacks. Um, and these are not like software software hacks where you hack a web page or something. These are like real life hacks that you um, use a device or a technology out of its context, out of its purpose. And um, I was participating for two times in a row uh, with different projects and I was very fortunate enough to, to win the title of the best hack of the month two times in a row, and then for the third time, I thought if I win it again, they would give me a cup, you know, like the World Cup. If you win it three times, you get to keep it. Um, because there was a trophy that they were giving, uh, giving out, and then you take it back every month. And the question was like, you know, what can I do more um, to impress these amazing people, these amazing hackers? What is the, the ultimate hack? And um, well, I looked no further than uh, than myself and, and my brain. In fact, um, I had the idea that maybe, um, maybe we can do something with the brain. We can type with the brain. Now, obviously, this idea is not new. It's been around for a very, very long time. And I think last year, um, or maybe the year before, Elon Musk came up with the idea of a new company, Neuralink. And what they do is they build a high-speed highway between your brain and a computer. So they are building brain-computer interfaces or human-machine um, interaction devices. And what they aim is to have to open your skull and put some electrodes there that will transmit wirelessly your thoughts to a computer or your phone so that you can type um, or communicate with your brain signals. And he had this code. I think we're about eight to 10 years away from this being usable by people with no disability. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, in a few minutes. But you know, Elon Musk is a great, great guy, but he's a little bit optimistic <laughs> about everything, his deliverables as well. And um, this is not going to, this is not going to work in eight to ten years. In fact, this field 
is being tackled for the past uh, 30 years now. It started in 1988, and um, we still have like 20, 30, or maybe um, 50 years to make this work with real people, um, with people with no disability. There's a distinction between people with disabilities and not, um, um, able-bodied people. Obviously, it's a lot straightforward. We treat able-bodied people like mice, um, lab mice, because you know they respond perfectly to whatever you give um, to them. So uh, we do the research on them. But in fact, um, the actual target is disabled people. So if you have ALS, if you have locked-in syndrome, and um, if you cannot move your arm or eyes or, or any muscle, in fact, you still deserve to communicate with the outer world because you can think. There is nothing wrong with your brain, your mind, other than that your body is paralyzed. So it's, um, it has its own difficulties and challenges working um, with people with disabilities in this context. But the end goal is to make this um, a part of everybody's lives, especially people with disabilities, so that they can, um, you know, they are back, back in the game. So Facebook also uh, made an announcement um, right after that, I think one or two months after that, after Elon Musk, and they said, we're also working on brain-computer interfaces. And they said, our goal is to build a brain-computer interface that lets you type to your mobile phone. You don't dictate with your voice, you just think, and you're going to be able to type much faster than you can physically type with your fingers. So this is like a superhuman ability, or this is going to be. And she was a little bit realistic. She said, this is going to be there in 20 years. So we're just kicking off, and you know, it's, it's some future technology. So bear with us. We'll, we'll take some time um, to, to make this a reality. Now, this is a picture from, I guess, eight years ago, from 2010. This is me in the picture, if you um, couldn't um, identify by now. And this is my assistant. Um, no, I'm kidding. She, is, she was my best friend. She is still my best, best friend. And she was helping me out with this experiment. Um, this is right before a live broadcast where I demonstrated a brain-computer interface where I typed with my brain signals in real time on TV. And um, I was getting ready uh, for, for that. And this was eight years ago. So this tweet is from January 6, 2010, and I typed it with my brain signals, all with, with all the smileys and, and everything. And I tweeted with my brain signals. So no um, motor neurons involved or no muscles involved in the making of this tweet. And it's still there, I think, in my profile. So um, if you go way back, eight years back, you can see that this technology is actually reality right now. And I'm here today um, to talk about how we do this with JavaScript, because that is the, the hack part of it, right? Uh, it's great to be able to type something from your brain, but it's even cooler if you can do it with only JavaScript and, and nothing else. Obviously, um, this was part of my master's thesis back at the university, and I was using MATLAB, C++, C, and C Sharp all together to make this happen, writing low-level drivers for EEG headsets and the UI in, in C Sharp. That wasn't a, a good experience. And all the um, classification algorithms, we call them machine learning algorithms right now, um, but that's a fancy name. So all the classif classification algorithms were in MATLAB, and it worked really good. You can type up to 20 to 25 characters per minute. So it's like every two, three seconds, you can type a single letter. And if you think this thing works with um, locked-in patients, it's the world of a difference for them. You know, one, one day, you have no ability to, to communicate with your loved ones. And the, the other day, you can type like one letter or one symbol, like an emoji as well, in, in a few seconds. That's, that's a huge, huge difference. And um, that's why I picked up this topic again. Um, so a little bit introduction on EEG. Raise your hands if you know what EEG is. A lot of people. That's great. Um, raise your hands if you ever saw an EEG recording like this. 
OK, great. EEG means electroencephalography. So the basic idea is we have electrodes on your scalp, and uh, they track the electrical activity in your brain or on your skull. Not in your brain, obviously. This is a non-invasive operation so that we don't delve into our brain. Uh, but we gather whatever we can from your scalp. Hence, that's why I'm, I'm bald. Um, <laughs> because it works best. You know, life sometimes has this um, push a little help. Like, <laughs> when you want to do research about brain signals, life takes away your hair from you. And it's, it's a perfect match. <laughs> um, so this is one of the earliest EEG recordings in history that's done by a German scientist called Hans Berger. I'm not making the name up. I know that's the most common German name, Hans and Berger. But it's a, a real name of a very well-known scientist um, in, in Germany in 1924. So he, was, he had the idea that the brain is very powerful, so maybe we can record electricity out of it. And he came up with this experiment. And this is one of the earliest recordings of brain signals. However, um, the scientific community mocked him. Um, they shut him out. And they, like, nobody believed him. For about 10 years, he was struggling with this. He lost all of his credibility um, in, in the scientific community. But after 10 years, some people were able to um, replicate his results and his experiments that you know, some people have different electrical um, activity in, in, in their brain. And then they restored his, um, his career. But this is what happens to very early people. If you're an innovator like this, um, you, uh, you face the risk of being mocked. But he persisted on, and the, the story is a happy ending story. And he was, you know, he is the founder of, of this whole EEG thing. And now, you know, we treat millions of patient, patients every year with this technology. So it's, it's a um, groundbreaking thing. But uh, one thing you'll notice here is that obviously the resolution of the data is not that interesting. It's almost like a science wave. Um, both on the, uh, on the bottom and on the top as well. And um, obviously, the equipment of the past was unable to gather high frequency, high quality data from the brain. It was still useful, though. Um, this was still useful. And nowadays, we have huge improvements in technology. And also, we digitalized, obviously, everything. And what this means is we now get very quality signal out of the brain. Um, and right now, it almost looks like noise. If you ever saw audio noise, um, it almost looks like noise because it includes your brain signals plus all the electrical and magnetic noise around you. Um, therefore, the best experiments are done in something called a Faraday cage. Um, raise your hands if you know what a Faraday cage is. Yeah, so it's completely isolated magnetically, so even God can't see you inside. Um, and there are no, no interceptions from any mobile signal, wireless signal, radio signal, whatever, and you and your brain signals only. And that is the safest place to run these experiments. Um, but yeah, so it's very, very high quality. You know, um, like 96 kilohertz sampling rate, which is really high for brain signals, which are from 0 or 1 hertz to maybe 30 hertz. Um, so we have a lot of signals that we have um, that we can work with. And the challenge is actually huge. But um, hopefully, I will be able to demonstrate how this thing works in JavaScript. So I built a node application, um, a, an electron application for this. And let's see if it's going to work. It might not. Yeah. Does not. Because that's how live demos go, right? Um, most of the time, it just doesn't work. So this is me sitting in my home with the same headset, with the same laptop. And I'm demonstrating how the, the typing actually works. Do you, do you wonder how it works? Is this interesting to you? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So there's a countdown. and. Basically, what I do is I just stare at the screen, and the computer knows what I 
want to type. Here I'm trying to type a message, hello. That's the first word in hello world. So that's also in, on my Twitter profile. If you go to my Twitter profile, it's the pinned tweet, so you can watch this afterwards. So I just stare at the screen. There are letters there. These, if you cannot, oh, oh. Uh-oh. That was the wrong button. Let's skip forward. Yeah. If uh, you cannot identify them, these are letters of the alphabet. And they are flashing. They are randomly flashing. And I want to type one single letter. I think I now want to type E. And I'm looking at E. OK? And whenever E flashes, I'm counting it internally. Oh, sorry, this is still the H. And let's do the exercise. So I'm looking at E right now. And whenever it flashes, I'm going to count. One. Two. Three. And so on and so forth. And after a certain amount of data being gathered, the system knows that um, you are being excited about a single letter, and that's E. And all the other letters, when they're flashing, they don't mean a thing to you. So obviously, I mentioned the quality of this headset, um, and that it's a consumer-grade headset. That's why it takes a um, significant amount of time to come up with the letter. But um, you, have, you can run any, any machine learning algorithm or um, any classifier, TensorFlow, or whatever you want um, in order to identify these patterns um, of these brain signals. So it's actually very simple and kind of a boring watch. Um, so I just look at the screen and I cannot move. I'm not allowed to move because, again, um, this headset uses contact lens solution. Have you ever tasted it, the contact lens cleaning solution? Raise your hands if you ever tasted it. Yeah, one, two, per perfect. Yeah, we, yes, I love you. Um, uh, of course I did, because you know it, it looks like water, right? There has to be something special in it. What is it? Um, it has some salt in it. Um, it's a salty solution, saline solution we call it. Um, and that's the perfect thing for this headset because it increases the, the transmission of electrodes, um, electrons uh, from your skull um, scalp to, to the electrodes. So um, you just wet the, the pads here, the electrodes, put it on your, on your hair or your um, bald head, and then um, you get nice signals. Obviously, in real life, in the hospitals or in actual research, we use gels that are very sticky and that, is, that are really hard to get out of your, um, your hair. Um, Hence, I had to use myself as a research subject when I was doing this research. But, <coughs> sorry. Um, but the idea is that if you move your head, obviously there is no strong connection between the electrodes and, and your head. And these signals are on the order of microvolts, like 10 microvolts, 20 microvolts. That's very, very small. And when you move your head, the muscles come into play. And obviously, oh yeah, <laughs> yes, I was able to type hello. And yeah, I then right away posted this on, on Twitter, of course, because why not? Um, but if you move your head, what you see is, in fact, um, there is a lot of noise, both due to your own movement and the movement of the electrodes. It's, it's, it's actually a very... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can imagine the, the level of excitement that I had, right? Um, it was huge. So let's, how do I move forward? Yeah, all right, so how does this black magic work? What is the underlying mechanism for this thing? Um, now, we have 100 billion neurons in our brains, 100 billion. Neurons. It's like the number of galaxies in the universe. It's a lot. It's a huge number. And currently, I have 14 electrodes on my scalp. And the best devices that are external, that are non-invasive, have like 256 electrodes, which leaves you with 400,000 neurons per electrode. Okay? 
which means we actually don't know what's going on in your brain. We have no idea. What we get is a single electrical lead that gives you the sum of 400,000 different um, neurons firing in different directions. And the worst part is these electrical signals are vectors. Um, we're at a university, so I can maybe talk a little bit about math. These are vectors that have an amplitude and a direction. So one neuron is firing this way, okay? The other neuron is firing this way. When you sum them up, what do you get? Zero, right? So imagine how many neurons fire in all the ways of 400,000 neurons. And what you end up with is, you know, mostly zero. You don't really get a lot of signals. Um, obviously, in certain situations, you get certain signals. But it's really, really hard to, to get quality, quality signals from the brain. But obviously, if we could, if we had um, a way to go inside your brain and to implant electrodes there, we could even read your dreams. In fact, there is research um, being done for this. Even with external um, high-resolution electrodes, we can read what people see. So it's like a live feed of what you see. Because all you see, actually, is information that's been transferred to your brain and it's processed um, on the back of your skull. And by just reading um, there, we can see what you see. Um, obviously, very, very low resolution, but um, research is being done on this. OK, so there are some chemical reactions of potassium and sodium that exchange. Um, well, one neuron exchanges potassium, and the other one um, gives sodium. And then there is a potential difference, which basically means voltage. There's a voltage difference, and this is what we measure uh, from, the, from the brain. Now, um, if you open the skull, you can, with the consent of the person, of their family, of their hospital, and of the government, because the, the patient has to be terminally ill, because the um, probability of losing the patient is really high if you open their skull, and implant electrodes. Um, some people receive it very well. Some of the brains just reject the electrodes, and terrible things can happen. That's why this is not going to happen in, in the next 8 to 10 years. Uh, maybe it's going to take 50 years to get all the governments on board um, and to make this technology a safe technology to operate. But if you can do that, then you can implant thousands of electrodes inside the brain. Then you have a lot more visibility in the actual um, firings of not individual neurons, obviously, because nobody can use 100 billion electrodes, but at least um, a little bit more resolution. But the, the underlying idea is, unfortunately, we just don't know how it works. And that is the, that is the worst, worst bit um, about this. OK, so what I just showed you on, on the video is something called a P300 signal. And um, it's called the oddball paradigm. Why the oddball paradigm? Because I have 35 different letters that I'm not interested in. I'm only interested in one symbol or one letter. And that is odd. You know, the, the probability of that flashing is very tiny uh, with respect to the other ones. And um, therefore, the name is the oddball paradigm. And this has been first published about in 1988, 30 years ago, uh, by Immanuel Donchin. They were able to write um, or type 2.3 letters per minute. And then, you know, um, we were able to expand this to, to further 10 letters, 20 letters, and, and further. Um, so I already talked about how this thing works. It works based on randomly flashing letters in a matrix. and um, what you see is that there is an action potential 300 milliseconds after you see the letter flashing, and you're excited by it. If you look at the graph in the black, in the black one, you see um, the actual signal that we're interested in. And if you can read it, after 0 0.3 seconds, 300 milliseconds um, of the original signal, you see a peak in the signal, in the black signal. That is what gives us 
um, this notion of, yes, this is what the person is looking at, so this is what they actually want to type. You gather hundreds of these and, and refine your judgment about what letter, that they, um, what letter they want to type. The thing is, the red one is the other signal, all right, the regular signals. So if you can separate the black from the red, you can do this task. It's, uh, it doesn't look like really hard because there is a certain difference in between these signals, but obviously these are refined. These are averages of, again, about 50 to 100 different um, signals from both for the black and the red groups. Um, usually what you see is the difference is not so clear. Sometimes you just focus on a different letter because your attention just diverges. And you, know, you get a lot of false positives, false negatives, and um, it's the, the machine learning task to make sure you can separate these um, black from red. So how do you start with JavaScript? Any JavaScript developers here? Please raise your hands. OK. Um, it's OK to admit if you're a JavaScript developer. I'm a <laughs> I'm a proud JavaScript developer, and I'm here to prove to the world that JavaScript can do anything. Desktop mobile applications and brain signal applications, although it didn't work previously because of the headset. Um, raise your hands if you know JavaScript. You don't have to. Yeah. All right. So everybody can read this code, right? It's actually very straightforward in, in plain language. Constant mind requires wits. Um, then you do mind open and open your mind. And then you read your mind to, to the console. Now, Let's see if this thing is <coughs> sorry, is going to work, because it looks like I have connection. Yeah. So these are the real-time brain signals. Thank you. Obviously, you cannot discern what the individual signals mean. Um, and you get a lot of muscle movements when I'm talking, when I'm speaking, or when I'm moving, even when I'm moving my hands. So it's, Pretty much all the information is invisible to the eye, but there is only two types of information that you can see with your eyes, and that is, for example, when I'm blinking. And now, let me do it. So you see the peaks, right? One, two, three. The peaks there are um, the cause of the blinks, my eye blinks. And in fact, they are not even brain signals, they are your muscle signals, because I have a lot of electrodes um, around my eye here. Now, there are a huge um, ton of misinformation or disinformation about this online. People claim that it's easy to read brain signals and, and they do all sorts of things with their brain signals, but what they usually do is they use the muscles and muscle signals because they are at least an order of magnitude um, bigger or higher than, than actual brain signals. So again, when I blink my eye, that is what you see and that's mostly through my muscles. And I can play with my jaw. <laughs> and again, I'm moving a lot of muscles on my face, and these are all muscle movements. These don't contain much um, brain signals or, or information in your brain signals. OK, I'm glad that this demo worked. Let's maybe move on to the other one. So I'm going to type const uh, mind require widths, right? Mind.open and mind.read console log. Now, hopefully, when I run this, what you will see is, yeah, here it is. Basically, a JSON log of your brain. <laughs> so, Thank you. So what you have is the, uh, the battery percentage, the counter number, so you can track each frame, contact quality uh, in an arbitrary fashion, the gyro, so you can also track your head movement, and the levels of each electrode that's present in the system. Obviously, these are just numbers. So if you know how to work with numbers, you can do anything with your brain signals. And yeah, this is an infinite, um, infinite loop of, of, of brain signals. And every seven milliseconds, it's like 128 hertz. Every second, uh, every seven milliseconds, you get one signal um, or one reading from your brain, and it's up to you to aggregate them and, and make them uh, make them work. 
Um, I wrote a C driver for, for the headset, but then um, everything else is in JavaScript. So Node.js binding, bindings, and then um, basically all, <coughs> sorry, all the operation is in JavaScript. Um, there is another, oh, oh, by the way, this, this tool is open source. So if you want to check the source code, fork or contribute to it, um, you're welcome. There is another one called Brain Monitor. That is like a command line um, monitor, just like this. I mean, the same thing in your command line. Let's see if it's going to work. So you just type brain monitor. And yeah, it does. And you see the peaks there. <laughs> this is running in your command line. You can run this in, in, in whatever machine you like, in, in the cloud as well, if you like. So, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you can upload your brain to the cloud, right? All those, buzz <laughs> all those buzzwords that don't mean anything. But um, you can see the gyro on the top right corner. And when I move my head, hopefully, you will see the action replicated there. Um, so if you want to do you know, mouse tracking with your head or something and your brain signals, you know, clicks with the eye blinks, you can, you can do those type of uh, demos. In fact, the, um, the quality is kind of not, not bad right now. All right, let's go back to the presentation. And the last one is the brain bits. This is the application that lets you type um, with your brain signals that I demoed in the video. It's also open source. Everything, again, is in JavaScript. Um, it's called a P300 speller because it makes use of these P300 waves or signals in your brain. Um, and it, still needs a lot of help, especially um, with the machine learning algorithms. So if you are into machine learning, uh, please lend a hand. Uh, I plan to port it to TensorFlow.js and, uh, and make use of it. So maybe if somebody wants to contribute, I'm, I'm open for contributions. OK, the tech stack is JavaScript all the way up. This thing didn't have uh, native drivers, so I had to write some native C add-ons for the headset to make it talk to JavaScript. But then Node.js is doing the processing. All the machine learning algorithm is running on, um, on Node.js in real time, in fact. Uh, we use the Electron as a wrapper for the desktop application, because you can ship this as a desktop application. And of course, obviously, you can also put it um, as a web page and have something like a WebSocket or something. Um, I use Vue.js on the front end. Anybody uses Vue.js? Only a few people. Yeah. Um, it's Really easy. It's, it's a very, very um, purpose-built, fast front-end framework. And all the lines that are being drawn are um, done with Vue.js. I use brain.js. That was an existing library for neural networks. And basically, you can swap in any algorithm that you want. You can use neural networks. Or I use my own classifier uh, from 10 years ago that I wrote in MATLAB. Um, it's a custom Bayesian linear discriminant analysis, um, something like that. It's called Bayesian linear Dis discriminant anal analysis. And um, it's the classifier that, that I showed in the demo um, that is, again, optimized for, for this brain task. And I had to port it from MATLAB, right? Anybody knows MATLAB? Raise your hands. Perfect. One single um, character, like the star character for matrix multiplication in MATLAB is like a 1,000 lines in JavaScript. I had to write a lot of JavaScript forming, transforming all those functions of matrix, transposition, and, and eigenvectors and everything, and had to write or find alternatives in JavaScript, but I did. It worked. And unfortunately, I couldn't find a very good um, function to give me the, the eigenvalue of, um, of a piece of data. And I still use MATLAB for it. I built a web server in MATLAB to serve the eigen, eigen function, so eigen function. So all the processing, all the data crunching is in JavaScript, and there are no web servers. And MATLAB has the web server. So it's the, the roles are switched between JavaScript and Node.js and, and MATLAB. And it's serving one single function. If you don't have MATLAB on your computers, that's fine. You don't have to. It's a, it's a very expensive purchase. Um, then you can use the JavaScript fallback, which is not that performant. All right, so what do we do? We get the raw electrode data that looks like noise. And 
if you remember the graph that I showed you earlier, it's a section of one second after the flash. So after we flash each letter, we take one single second, we call it an epoch, and we try to look for a peak right after 300 milliseconds. But obviously, um, the brain has a lot of information of um, a lot of different frequencies, so we have to filter them out, especially the low and the high frequencies, so we get a specific bandwidth of frequencies that we are looking for. Um, we then cut the outliers out uh, by a process called winserization. So the top 5% and the low 5% are kicked out. By the way, I'm telling you the secret of my research, um, which is publicly published anyway, but um, nobody wants to read 150 pages of math, right? Um, but if you implement this algorithm, um, you can already start typing with your brain signals. Um, and then we normalize data because obviously the amplitude of each electrode is different. From time to time it changes and you have to identify what the peak is, right? Maybe you see a peak but the actual amplitude is very small, maybe it's just noise. Um, so you have to make sure you're actually looking at the brain signal and not um, a radio cell tower or something. So we normalize data and then we do something called decimation. We don't need that, that, many, um, um, that many samples to, to decide, actually. Does anybody know the Nyquist theorem? Nyquist theorem? A few people. All right, tell me, please, if we are interested in the signals between 1 and 12 hertz, how many um, samples do we need to be able to faithfully reproduce the signal of 12 hertz max? 24, yes, because um, it's like a sine wave. You need an end point and a start point uh, to actually, or a midpoint to actually be able to figure out a sine wave. So at the minimum, you need 24 samples if you are interested in 12 hertz. Um, I know this is a little bit technical, but please um, don't let me lose you. Um, yeah, so you remove most of the samples because nobody can crunch that many data, not even MATLAB. And then you apply machine learning. You use either neural networks or custom algorithms, whatever you wish, to identify the, um, the red and the black, black signals, right? Um, all right, so the conclusion is people say JavaScript is powerful uh, when it comes to reading JSON APIs, when it comes to consuming JSON APIs. And what I claim is, it's, yes, it is powerful enough to read and parse JSON APIs, but it's also powerful to read and parse your brain's API. So this is a demonstration of that work. Um, and I kind of open sourced the path into our brains, and now I'm looking for contributors to make brain bits or JavaScript shine again. Please raise your hands if I were able to change your minds about JavaScript. Okay, a few people. That's good. I call it a win. This is, this is a good day. <laughs> cool. Yeah, because I claim JavaScript can't do anything. I also do music with it. Um, but that's, that's the topic of, of another, um, another talk. So thank you for coming today. And um, if we have any time, I think we can have some questions. A few little minutes. Yeah, a few little minutes. And I might have a, another demo later in the day um, at the UNU, UNU boot. If you come, you can see me um, using my brain signals to use the force in, in Star Wars. Um, <laughs> it's very dangerous, so I didn't want to do it here. Uh, but I'm going to try to use the force with my brain signals later. So if you have any questions, maybe one or two questions, I can have them. Anybody? No? Oh, there is one. What's the state of hardware in, in this area? Can anybody find this kind of hardware start hacking around uh, in Cool. Yeah. yeah, the question is, can you actually buy a hardware like this? Like, can anybody buy it? Do you need ID verification to buy this hardware? No, you don't need IDs for guns, in, in the US at least, so you don't need IDs to buy this. Um, it's publicly available. This is a consumer-grade hardware. Um, it's about, I don't know, like, $700, $800, uh, and if you can shell out that money, you can do brain research uh, at home. Obviously, there are more professional level hardware that you still can buy as individuals, but they would cost you around $20,000. <laughs>
So not that easy. Um, only the labs can afford it. Um, but yeah, if as an individual you're interested in it, there are a lot of cheaper models as well. But um, the one that I'm using is kind of the closest to a research grade hardware that lets you do all of this stuff. Um, the others are just toys. So um, yeah, this is publicly available and, and you, can, you can get on board. Any other questions? There's another one over there, please. I think, I think it's OK. And if you, I didn't spend the time, but if you spend the time to move the matrix multiplications into the GPU, it's going to be even faster, um, especially in the browser. Um, so Node.js uses the same core as the Chrome um, browser. So it is as performant as the browser, or the browser is as performant as Node.js. Um, so you can all already do live. Um, transcription of your brain, as we saw it, um, in the browser as well, and it's, it's going to work. OK? Ah, one more there, please. Those are very dark waters. <laughs> Um, but yes, anything is possible. And unfortunately, to be completely honest, I also fear that this tech will go into wrong hands. And if surveillance governments forces you to use this tech against the, the citizens, it's going to be a nightmare. Um, so it's, it's actually, it can be used as, as a weapon as well, at least to parse your memories and whatever you see. Um, so that's, you know, think about somebody embedding an electrode in your brain, and then they get live feed of whatever you see, and you cannot turn it off. And it takes your body's power to function, so you cannot also plug the power. It's very, very dystopic, but um, sorry for, for bringing down the mood. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of applications. Most of them are very dangerous. <clears throat> um, any other questions? One more. OK, this is the last one. Please. Pushing data to the brain. <coughs> yes, it's theoretically possible. Um, not at this level, obviously. But um, people claim to do in, in interesting things. Um, but it's also very, very dangerous for health. You can instantly kill somebody. Um, and that's, that's not, not a good way. Uh, but yeah, it's theoretically possible. So thank you, everybody, for coming today and for listening to me. I hope you have a great conference. Thanks.